Hello, welcome to Life Repair Radio Talk Radio. I am Kaylee Powers. I'm here with your host, Rick Thompson. This show is about sobriety and recovery. Each week we discuss a different topic relating to addiction. With the aim, you can gain some insight, guidance, and hope from our discussions. We focus the show in three different segments. One, the viewpoint of the families dealing with a family member suffering from alcoholism and addiction, so they may assist them in obtaining treatment. Two, the psychological trauma and the emotional damage alcoholics and addicts and their families experience. Three, the role of the insurance companies and associated providers and their part in the recovery process. Thank you, Kelly. Hello, everyone. Come on in, get comfortable, and welcome to the show. I'm Rick Thompson. Tonight, we're going to talk about chronic relapse and what that entails to the individual who cannot stay sober and the effect on the recovery environment. In the second part of the show, we shall address intimate relationships within the first year of recovery. I couldn't even say that with a straight face. I'm sorry. (laughs) And the pros and cons connected to it. The third segment shall be dedicated to the callers, if you have the guts to call in. In the studio tonight are Kaylee Powers, who is a recovery intervention counselor at Zen Detox, providing detox and counseling to individuals and families affected by substance abuse, in addition to infrastructure support as a sober companion. She also participates in relapse assessment, substance abuse crisis counseling, and facilitates recovery groups. And our dear friend, Jerry Ross, who was a previous guest, is in recovery. He will also share his strength, hope, and experiences, and moderate insanity with us. Hello, Kay, Lee, and Jerry. How are you this evening? Hello, Rick. Good. Thanks for Okay. Me. We're going to go right into this. So, Kaylee? Yes. Can you please give us an overview of what it is that you do within the recovery establishment? Sure. I work a lot with the chronic relapse population, people who are in and out of treatment. A lot of them are suffering from post-acute withdrawal syndrome. They have a lot of physical things going on. I work with them on different medical interventions. I also work with people who have long-term sobriety where cross-addiction starts to show up or they have chronic pain issues and they need help treating those things as well. What do you feel is the hardest part of your job? The chronic relapsers and their place in the AA community and in life in general and how to help them deal with their shame and self-punishment. Okay. This question is to both of you. How do you feel the family of the person who is suffering with their addiction move forward to obtain help and treatment for the addicted family member? Either one of you can run with that bond. Well, I don't know about that clinically. Um, What I can tell you is my experience is that a family that's been exposed to an alcoholic or an addict over a period of time gets almost as sick, if not sicker, than the alcoholic. And I believe that for them, uh, there's programs that they can go to. There's there's Al-Anon, there's Alateen, and other uh, 12-step based programs for the family uh, of the alcoholic or the addict. I agree 100%. I actually have 11 years in Al-Anon myself, Mm -hmm. and it's true. The People that are affected around the alcoholic can become as crazy, if not crazier, trying to control and manage something that they simply cannot do. Right. I remember I was sponsoring a guy years ago, and and his his wife called me up and uh, said he was out and that he was extremely drunk and that he was going to come home. And I said, and what is your plan? And she says, well, I don't know. That's why I'm calling you. Mm-hmm. I said, well, well, what happens? And she, and she told me that, uh, well, when he comes home, he becomes violent. He gets holes in the walls. And, you know, they, they had just had a, you know, a child six months earlier. And she says, what do you think I should do? And I said, leave. Get out of there. You know, don't take the chance. But, again, she didn't have a clue because, again, she had been with this guy over a period of time, and her uh, her perception of what her alternatives were were as narrow as his on how to cope with life. Right, because when you're in the middle of the disease, you have there's no vision, there's you no peripheral. Right. right. Yeah, you, in Al-Anon, they teach you to have a, a plan A, B, and C with those situations, and you mm-hmm. have a sponsor that will talk you through, okay, if he comes home relapsed, I'll do this. If he's sober, I'll do that. So... You're never left without resources. 
because that's a terrible place to be. Yeah, that's an understatement. So in, in your collective opinions, what's the first move for the person who is the uh, come to Jesus moment and the reality of their situation? To grab somebody that they trust and tell the truth and be humble and don't be alone and don't be ashamed and just try to make it through that night and get the help that you need. Right. I remember when I uh, made the decision to get sober again, um, I was, uh, I was done. It wasn't working, you know, and I, I, when it's not working, no matter what you do and the filter's gone, your best friend is gone. Well, then there you are. And, uh, you've only, I only had a couple of uh, ways to go. And one was permanent and the bad idea. And the other one was to get some balls and pick up the phone and call somebody and tell them I was broken and put my ego aside, which I didn't like doing that because, you know, the ego was my friend, which was killing me. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that great? Wow. <laughs> well, think about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, feel, I feel for anyone that, is, that has gone out and come back in. There's an individual that I know that um, is in the program, and he is a caregiver in the program. And he had a slip, and this individual is responsible for the lives of other people. And it's hard for, I, you know, I, I, he, a friend of mine who will be calling in assisted him in getting him into treatment. And the level of severity of what he was playing with, which, you know, was a light switch with his life. And he had the guts to go in and, you know, do this thing. And that, that, is, that impresses the hell out of me, is when somebody who's been in and goes out and then hits the wall, and instead of taking the cheap way out, you know, they suck it up and come back in. And that takes incredible courage. And you've got to dig deep for that, man. That's not something that hangs out on the surface. No. Yeah, Especially sure. when they keep trying and, you know, they, they have a seat as well. You know, they have the desire. They may not be able to get it that time, but as long as they keep coming back, they're safe for that day at least. Right, right. Well, um, this is something I thought about um, this morning kind of loosely. <laughs> There's no really easy way to say this or a straight way to say this is um, – the next topic I would like to talk about is relationships, also known as hostage taking and recovery. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when, you, when you're walking in the door and the booze and the dope are gone and, uh, you know, what's left? You know, what else can I do so I don't have to feel this shit that I've been feeling for the past decade or so? Hmm. Sex is good. That's a good idea. And I, I don't know anyone that hasn't engaged in a relationship on one way or another, uh, carnal or not, um, when they come in. Because, you know, you, you walk in there and it's like a smorgasbord of human beings, you know, that are just starving to death, you know. And um, by, uh, my take on it is uh, when your sponsor tells you not to have – a relationship for a year there's usually a very good reason behind it it comes from experience of that person having fallen down and skinning their knees and in light of other terms but i did it and i got my guts cut out i made some really stupid bonehead moves because i wasn't thinking about the outcome or the ramifications of what i was engaging into myself or the other individual i was just looking to not feel and that brings you to a whole new level of pain it did for me anyway um, Kaylee and Jerry, what are your experiences pertaining to the mindset of the recovery community about newcomers engaging in an intimate relationship within their first year? You want to hit this or you want me to go for it? I'll get it over with. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I have a lot of experience. Now, I'm an Al-Anon, so my perspective is different than AA, but 
I have experience with this professionally with a lot of rehab romances. And I've actually seen it both ways. I've seen the disasters, but I've actually also seen people help each other stay sober and be there for each other. If they both listen to their sponsors and put their programs first, that's key. Right. And if they're willing, you know, they keep it detached. And I've seen it work. Not often, but I have seen it work. Not a lot. <laughs> Not a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I'd like to. I mean, I. Uh, no, wow. I gotta tell you this. I, I do know, I do know some couples that actually came into this program, hooked it, and. Uh, you know, we're talking about 25, 30 years now, and not only are they still a couple, but they're still sober. More times than not, though, you know, it was like uh, this, um, I heard a speaker uh, who's, uh, he's from over the hill, that mm. would be in the 310 oh, area, right. yeah. <laughs> and uh, it takes about I don't know twelve to fifteen hundred drunks to keep him sober. But anyway, I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. go into who. Yeah. My favorite let's kind. Not, let's not judge. <laughs> no, of course, of course not. not. I judge no man. Never. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> he gave an example of uh, meeting on the uh, on the campus of recovery, and off in the distance he sees her, and she's in this long white daffodil gown, a top of a on on top of a horse, and and she looks across. And she sees him, and he's in this suit of armor on top of this huge black steed. And they get closer, and they get closer, and they get closer. And she looks at him, and she goes, Daddy? And he looks at her and goes, Mom. <laughs> and that's just about what I've seen for the most part. You know? Yeah. Now, when I, uh, the first time <clears throat> I got sober for, uh, for, for in, in earnest, uh, all of a sudden... I don't know, it must have been two or three months of sobriety, and I get this feeling. And then I look around and I realize, just like you said, this is a smorgasbord. Because if you, if you drank and used like I did, you were alone most of the time. Right. So I called my sponsor because I had heard this, you don't get into a relationship in your first year. And I called my sponsor and he said, well, there's no place in our uh, literature literature that says... You, you, you need to do that. Right. And I said, really? And he says, yeah. He said, so I said, so I can, I can go out and hook it? And he says, absolutely. And I said, oh, thanks, man, so much. He said, oh, there's just one thing, though. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, uh, you can't lie. you got to be honest. And I said, well, well how am I going to get laid? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there's that. That is a nice <laughs> twist. I like that. Yeah. yeah. It's true. And, um, and, and it happened. And I was honest, mm -hmm. and uh, but I think <clears throat> I think it harkens back to don't make any life changing decisions in your first year, and that's based on experience. That's nowhere in the book, but you know uh, we come in and we are so broken. We are so in a world of of uh, of, of questions because uh, for so many years we've relied on whatever we've relied on in order for uh, to to maintain some form of personal security, whatever it is, from whatever type of drug it is, whether it's from drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever, food. And then <clears throat> this first year is about getting acquainted with yourself and being able to uh, finally start to label these feelings and not be afraid of them right. and face them and uh, and put them in the proper perspective. And for me, it, it was much longer than a year process. But the fact is, is that had I made some life-changing decisions in my first year, they'd have been based on false information. True, and probably some of those would have even been fear-based. I know that some of yes, my decisions of were fear-based, yeah. reactionary. I remember the, the, fir the first thing I did out of the gate is I uh, met this fellow and his wife, and uh, not knowing their dynamic in their relationship, um, she starts coming at me. And this woman was drop dead beautiful, just gorgeous. And uh, he was kind of a flake, but then again, so was I. <laughs> and everybody else was in the room. And so I said to her, because, you know, I wanted to be ethically immoral about this. <laughs> I said, well, look, A, if this is going to happen, you have to move out and file divorce papers or I'm not getting involved in this. 
So I thought I was clean. And so she does this. Oh, no. And she's out the door. And we hook up, and here we go. And then she one day went, ah, nope, got to go. And then I, I collapsed like a bunch of broccoli you know, <laughs> in the middle of my home, you know, wondering what just happened. And those are the, the slaps that you get when you're not on a level of clarity where you can see the entire perimeter of what the hell is going on and what can come at you if you make that decision. This could happen if you make that decision. This is going to happen. And then people get hurt. Consequences. Right. And then people, and then uh, potential friendships are destroyed. You know, when it comes oh. to guys, I mean, forget that. I, you know, that's not fixable, unfixable. Yeah. And, you know, I had many relationships like that in my first year. That worked. No, that was my first triangle and my last triangle relationship. But, you know, after that, you know, I'm not wanting to feel anything. And so it was like hitting a wall with the drugs and the alcohol. When that didn't work, I had to do the work. And if I wouldn't have done the work, I wouldn't be sober right now. That's you know? a good point. You know, when you're replacing the drink or drug with a person, that's basically why that suggestion is in place to avoid that from happening. I think it always comes back to filling the, a particular hole. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, for me, that hole has never been able to be filled by anything human. At least that's what I've come to discover for myself. It's pretty much a temporary situation, any way you look at it. Um, it's uh, <laughs> it's dangerous ground to be standing on when you're a newcomer. I mean, it just it really is. I mean, when you're just sitting there and you're just you're basically you're uh, vulnerable. Yeah, you're very vulnerable. Um, yeah, it's um, it's a, it's an incredible situation. That's that's a major understatement. And hopefully, you have the support of your friends in AA that can guide you, not judge you, not punish you, but guide you and just tell you what they've experienced like we're talking about today and that can help. Right. Just so you know, if you'd like to call in and join us on the air, our call-in number is 323-203-0815. That's 323-203-0815. And we're in the studio tonight with Kaylee and Jerry and myself, and uh, we're uh, talking about uh, faux pas in your first year. Um, and there's, there's many to be made. And, uh, you know, the, another question I had in my mind, um, is you guys feel that there's a level of denial by the newcomer of their individual diseases when jumping into the boy meets girl scenario, um, thereby creating another filter from their condition and potentially degrading their emotional, mental, and spiritual stability. You want to run that by me one more time. Sure, man. Okay. But my Pardon thought me. on this is like, do you, you know, do you feel, there's, you feel like you're in denial about where you are when you start hopping into bed with somebody in, in, within the rooms of recovery? That's the short version of the long version. Do you think there's damage that can be done to a newcomer? Or, oh, well, obviously, you know, reiterating to a point of what I just said. But I just wanted to hear your viewpoints on it. Well, certainly, if you've got a, any length of time and and you're you're preying upon a newcomer uh, uh, under the guise of program stuff, mm -hmm. well, then you're you're just an absolute. Uh, to me, it's 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 akin to uh, uh, it's a prelude to murder. Well, yeah, okay. If you're, if you, uh, I'm, you know, if you are someone that's been around for a while, absolutely, absolutely, because you're a predator. But if you're just, you know, if you're another newcomer and you're sitting there spinning like a little mouse, you know, next to the other one spinning like a little mouse. Good I mean, luck, y'all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Live long and prosper if you can. <laughs> if you can. And if you make it back, we'll talk about what you really want to do about yourself. Now, the other thing about that is that when, the, when, if you get into involved into a relationship with somebody. In the rooms, when it breaks up, who gets possession of the room? That's it's like the a house, really good question. Right? right? I mean, you know, you, uh, me, I stayed. I didn't care because I didn't care. You know, I could care less. I'm not leaving, and they didn't leave either. Most of them, you know, got married to somebody else, which is fine by me. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's really uh, an interesting. Uh, it's, it's, you know, who gets the room? I mean, I, I don't even know how the hell that got created. Who should care? But it really happens. A lot of people, you know, the girls are over in the corner talking about the guy because he's a, he's a nightmare. You know, he did this, he did that. He's, 
you know, and then the guys do the same thing. Well, that's a good argument for having more than one home group and having your recovery spread out a little bit so you have other options. You know, you want to have where you know you can get what you need, but you also want to have a good phone list with a lot of people to call because drama's going to happen in the rooms regardless whether you're in a relationship or not, even in right. friendships. So you want to have the other option and not get too enmeshed in general. Right. Well, you know, that's um, got the stories I've got in my mind about the things I've seen in the rooms over the years. And, I mean, I've seen... I don't think regular seen, people would even believe it. Yeah, they wouldn't believe it. I mean, I've seen... Cat, well, I, I got sober in Dallas, in Texas, and it's a different animal there. Um, blood runs a little hotter down there for some reason. <laughs> and, I mean, I've sat there in, 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 in completely mellow meetings, you know, just discussions. And then I'll look over to the right. And there's this chick, she's eyeballing this other girl. And they're starting to look at each other. And I'm thinking, no, Uh-oh. this is not going to happen, right? And they leap at each other like two cats. And then you got a cat fight in the middle of a, of a meeting. And it's, I've never seen that in California. Never. I haven't. Maybe you have. Guys have, but I haven't. But. Well, actually, I was, in a, I was speaking in a meeting in Santa Barbara. And, Santa Barbara? Yeah. And some woman came in the door, walked over to a particular aisle, pointed at this woman and said something to the effect of, are you happy you split our family apart? Oh, no. Just, oh, yes. Ooh, yeah, I've seen and, that one. That's but, ugly. But I think <laughs> that's, that's never good. I think that that, <clears throat> that portrays, um, I don't think that that's portraying the program as it really is. I, I think that that's... Uh, uh, that can happen anywhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And... Uh, uh, well, I remember going to the old Radford when I was training as a substance abuse counselor, and I was brand new to AA because I come from the Al-Anon world, and just sitting there watching the dynamics that would go on and the people that were sharing and these girls that were getting up and making amends for sleeping with the room, and I was just like, is this really oh, happening? Like, am I really seeing this? And these girls... <laughs> were wearing these little sundresses and I was wearing combat boots and a leather jacket. I mean, I was like... Well, that's know, hot. Boundaries. <laughs> boundaries, boundaries. And I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Well, I think it comes down to uh, the, obviously the person that you pick as your sponsor. You know, uh, and uh, also, like Rick has been saying, uh, if you're putting the program first... If, if it's been ingrained in you that this has got to come first and that, you know, you have to find some level of morality in yourself, I think that by the time you get to that point, um, <clears throat> these instances happen less and less. Definitely. Because you're not going to engage in that type of behavior. Definitely. So. If you're putting the, the steps, your sponsor what is suggested right. your spiritual practice is very important you know if the person is for you they'll be there after you have some time absolutely well you hope so you hope so i mean i just um i've seen people run with that that scenario going from one relationship to another to another and just it's just like never ending until they literally get bounced from a room because the old timers just you know they say this is not working i mean because of the obvious People are coming in here because they're dying. We don't come here because we're doing really good. We're coming here because we're 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 almost dead, or we're going to be dead. And s- instinctively, we had something that brought us in. And you know, you're in there, and you've got people that are trying to save their lives. And what you're doing is you're killing them, and you don't realize that. And I didn't realize that until my sponsor said he got sick of yelling at me about it, and he sat me down. And he says, "Look at that girl right there." She's broken. Now look at you. You're still broken too. So what do you think broken and broken together is going to equal? And I said, broken. He said, no, dead. You know, and... Um, <laughs> How appropriate. Yeah, really. You know, law and order. <laughs> dun, dun. <laughs> but at the same time, in the back of your head, you're going, yeah, but this is going to be different. Oh, right. yes, absolutely. Of course. Yeah, because, yeah, we've never done this before. This is going to be fresh and new. Right. And just the pain mm-hmm. is fresh and new. 
because I'm the exception. Right. But your patterns are your patterns are your patterns. And if you haven't worked on your patterns, you're going to continue those patterns because you don't even realize that you have patterns. I didn't until I really sat down and I did a serious fourth step and, and went, oh, man, what am I doing? You know, I mean, I really when I saw the damage that I was doing to the women spiritually and doing it to myself at the same time, you know, it was it was I, I had a lot of guilt about that. Well, if you look at some of the literature, it says uh, uh, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relationship to this test. Was it selfish or not? Right. We asked God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly nor selfishly or to be despised and loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow towards it. And there is the rub. Mm -hmm. We must be willing to grow towards it. And the growth uh, does not, it's not like bamboo. It doesn't shoot up overnight. <laughs> it uh, takes a while. Yeah, that's true. It, um, it took me a long time. It took me about eight months and two sponsors because the first one fired me, which I totally understand because he, didn't want to, he just didn't want to hear it. And the second one would just sit there and shake his head and said, you're just keeping me sober, kid. You're not doing anything for yourself or anybody else. That's awesome. You know, and I, and I went, and I got, I got pissed. Well, yeah, I thought, you arrogant bastard. How could you say that to me? And then I went home and I thought about it, and I went, wow, I feel really stupid. <laughs> so I had to go back to him and apologize, you know. I always got the phone call, you know, man, I got to tell you, Spons, I met her, and I said, really? Great. Oh, yeah. She said, oh, said, yeah, man. We, like, went to coffee. We were there for, like, three hours, man. She's my soulmate. And I, I just won't say anything. And finally he'll say, so what do you think? And I'll say, you know, I'll ask him, so what were you doing uh, the day before you met her? And I, it, inevitably there's always silence on the other end of the phone. And then I ask him, I'll say, well, were you going to meetings? Yeah. Were you keeping commitments? Yeah. Were you working your steps? Yeah. I'll say, don't change a thing, because that's what got you attractive. That's what, why she wanted to be around you, is because of what that's you were doing. That's very positive. I really like that. Yeah, and it's familiar. The problem is that, pardon me, eight times out of ten, these guys start changing their... Schedule. Right. Immediately, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Because they're afraid of losing losing right. her and I, I'm sure that holds true with uh, uh, it's distraction well. it's a yeah. distracting it's a thing yeah, it's a complete distraction. and in Al-Anon I mean it's such a different perspective because you want to save that alcoholic and help that alcoholic and that is your drug you don't mm -hmm. need to drink anything. You want to chase them around and make sure they don't drink. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Then you don't need to think about yourself. Right. Right. Because that's the most interesting show across the street. Why would you want to stay on your side of the street with all your character defects? That's no fun. Yeah, that's never any good. That's for sure. Yeah, that's that's just. You know, I, I always wanted to. You know, wondered how much control do you feel uh, that a sponsor should exert on the newcomer, you know, in theory to protect them from themselves from getting hurt? It's a great question. And uh, none. They don't have any control. None. Yeah, the, the, my sponsor, <clears throat> when I got sober, um, my sponsor said, this is our deal. Some of it's in the book, some of it is not in the book. But in order for me to sponsor you, this is the deal that we're making, and if, and if you don't like the deal, then I can't sponsor you, which was fair, you know. He, he made no allusion to, um, to, in other words, he wasn't saying that his way was the way. It's, it was just that if that was what I wanted, if I wanted what he had, then this is what I was going to do. And um, for the most part, he did stick to what was going on with the program and the book, obviously. Uh, of course, there were some things he, uh, he said that uh, he didn't think I should share for the first six months I was sober because uh, I had heard the music of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I didn't know the words because mm -hmm. I was never listening. Right. And he said, listening is an art, so why don't you learn to listen and take six months to do that? 
Right. It was the best thing ever happened to me. That's interesting. Yeah. So what did you hear? Everything I needed to. Everything I needed to. And then the funny thing is this, is that when it came time, when that six months was up, um, I really didn't feel the, the need to have to share now. But what was interesting was my sponsor said, yeah, you've got six months and now you can, you can share. But you can only share for three minutes because that was the time limit. And in that three minutes, you have to share your experience, strength, and hope. And it made me, <coughs> pardon me, I'm so sorry. It made me edit all the bullshit into a three-minute uh, share that had meaning to it rather than something that I, at some point I was trying to get across. Right. I wasn't trying to get a point across. I was sharing what experience I had, what strength I had, and what hope I had. It was, it was a great lesson. Sounds like a really good way to deal with the ego of a newcomer, of feeling sure. that you have so much to say, you know, when you're in that pink cloud and you're so excited and you just want to tell everybody, but right. you really need to be listening. Mm-hmm. Well, one would hope that they would. Uh, if you get into enough pain, you're willing to do anything. Um, let's see. In the best case scenario, what would be your uh, ideal suggestion for a newcomer to make an honest attempt to stay focused on their program and not uh, fall into a potentially dangerous situation, which could, in fact, I guess, lead them back into their using again? I like the 90-90. And I heard recently get a commitment at every meeting you go to. That sounds overwhelming, but I think it's a great idea. It worked for me. I mean, I, I washed ashtrays when you could smoke in a meeting. I mean, I washed ashtrays, mopped the floors, set up chairs. I still do it. I still do it because it gives you, uh, you're committed. When you, you know, when you're walking in and you're helping set up 300 chairs, well, they're, you know, you're dependent on. And it gets you out of your head. And it yeah. makes you part of the situation, the bigger overall. And, uh, yeah, I was every I was going to three meetings a day. I lived right around the corner on purpose from the meeting from the meeting hall. And I would go in there and I would uh, do anything, anything, because, you know, I knew that if I didn't do this, I was I was going to the embalming table. I was convinced of it. But after, you know, at first I didn't like it I mean, I'd get pissed. And I'm sitting there scrubbing all the 45 ashtrays, and I'd be just cursing under my breath. And then one day I started feeling really good about it because there was a beginning and, and, a, and a middle and an end, you know, and it was tidy and it was together. And so I started being more tidy with my own house and make sure that my bed was made when I got up in the morning. I'd make my bed, say my prayers, and then go on with my day. And uh, so I think that that's really good practice for anybody that's new. And if, if you've got newcomers, that you should definitely direct them to do that. Because you're putting structure into a life that was so full of pain and unmanageability. Right. Well, also, uh, and, and it can deal with the, the ego as well. I remember, um, <laughs> yeah. I remember I was about three months sober, and I wasn't feeling a part of, and I was in front of this meeting, and one of the guys that had been around for a while was out there and, and he asked me how I was and I told him I'm, I just don't feel a part of and he said next week he said get here early and set up the chairs and don't tell anybody right and I looked into him I said what the hell is that going to do for me he said just do it and, 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 I, and I thought screw you the next week I showed up and I started to set these chairs up with the people that had that commitment when I sat down, when the meeting started, I looked around and I took a certain amount of pride in the fact that this person sat in a chair that I placed there for them. Right. There was something about that that made me feel like I had done something for the meeting and therefore I was a part well, of it. Well, you're of service, even if it's in a small way. Exactly. There's nothing negative that comes out of being of service, and that's in every spiritual teaching and principle. There you go, yeah. But AA has a really unique approach to being of service, and it's really how it all began, if you look back to Bill and Bob. Two alcoholics, it's like, well, I, I don't have anything. You can't teach me anything because I, I want to teach you and that's how it started it also goes back to that St. Francis prayer where it says uh, you know, God uh, help me to seek to comfort rather than to be comforted right Right. I mean there you go right yeah 
And you can't be selfish and self-seeking when you're doing that. That's true. You know, there's something I want to uh, touch on because you had told me that you were looking up uh, the story about Chris Batham. Yes. And for those who don't know who Chris Batham is, he is the founder and board chairman of a chain of more than 20 sober living houses and outpatient clinics in California and Colorado. He is also the subject of a December L.A. weekly cover story. And he has been sued three times in the past three months for allegations ranging from wrongful termination to sexual battery against his own clients. And the most recent lawsuit filed two weeks ago by uh, actually five former patients at one of Batham's community recovery CRLA facilities alleges that Batham isolated and targeted the plaintiffs and other women to prey on their addictions by using and supplying drugs around them moving them around to isolated hotel rooms in remote locations, encouraging them to use drugs with him and sexually molesting them when they were high or incapable of consent. What's your thoughts on that, Kaylee? Unfortunately, I believe it's probably true. I've seen a lot of mess in my work. Uh, I've been fortunate not to work in a place where anything went on like that. However, in sober livings, I've seen it. I've seen uh, managers get banned from meeting halls because they're offering uh, sex for rent to newcomers. So when I read the story, you know, I believe the victims. And it's unfortunate that he's not being shut down. Well, I think they're working on that. Um, you know, but that's, uh, I think one problem that is out there is there's not enough oversight on state or federal level on what these people are doing and when this kind of thing's going on i mean you're this guy if he is guilty this is all alleged he hasn't been convicted of anything if this individual is actually doing something like this he's killing people i mean because he's you know i mean how the hell can you even go there one if you've even really been around this program and you've worked, you know, this program to the best of your ability, how in the hell? I mean, you just there's got to be another issue going on psychologically with that individual. Well, aren't those places licensed by the state? Yeah, the but city I mean, I, I, yeah, oh, absolutely. But I mean, you know, I don't know what kind of oversight there is if there's an actual committee that, you know, clears an individual before they give them a license or do you you know so i've been told that some of these businesses just operate on a basic business license issued by the city mm. as you would you know i don't want to demean the level of this but the same as if you were to start a vending machine business it's just got a different and title the problem is like they said in the story unfortunately people don't believe drug addicts and alcoholics sometimes right. so Right. They're discredited as humans. That's the stigma that goes around the world. That's not just if you had a crime put against you, you know, because when you're in your addiction, you lie. So it's very confusing. And they said that's how he's been able to get away with it. Hmm. And a lot of the money that he was generating, people looked the other way, unfortunately. That right. was also a part of it. Right. Um I had a, an attorney, Mr. Alan Schimmel, that was on here a few weeks ago, who's representing five of these uh, girls. And, uh, you know, that kind of thought and that kind of evil uh, never even entered my mind. You know, maybe that's, I've gotten more naive as I've stayed sober all these years. And I'd like to believe the best in people, even though where I come from, and where a lot of us come from, we know that people are capable of anything at any given moment, period. And it seems like in this situation, the predators have the victims herded, especially if they own their own treatment centers. Well, I would and, like to think that that's more in the minority than... Well, than yeah. The, oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. of course it is. Yeah. And this individual, as far as I read, he is not in recovery and he does not have a history of sobriety so he doesn't have that connection he i don't know what he's running what game he's running but Just i don't think he came right. through it yeah he's making a lot of money off of very sick people and he's gotten this individual from what i've been told has made millions of dollars you know and uh now if he's doing the right thing 
you know, if he's giving back and he's helping people save their lives and giving them infrastructure that can benefit them, okay, fine. I don't care how much money he makes. But if you're going to do this and then you're going to, you know, damage g- little girls and women that are already crippled when they're coming in looking for anybody to hang on to that they can trust. And a lot of these poor women have male issues, maybe daddy issues or God only knows what else they've been put through in their lives. You know, and this is the last place they're going to go. And then you got to run into some scumbag like that uh, that's going to take advantage of them. And it's just it's horrifying to me. It's the worst type of exploitation you could imagine. Sure. Yeah, because once that once that, you know, knife has been put into someone's gut, there's no way the likelihood of them being able to trust anybody ever again is minimal. And I one of think. the victims died after an encounter like a couple weeks later, they said she overdosed. Mm. Not that that doesn't happen with people who aren't victimized, right. but I'm sure that if that did happen to her, it played a role. What a coincidence, huh? Yeah. Right. You wonder, you know, how do you sleep? Well, I mean, I, I ask myself, well, how could you sleep at night after you do that? Well, you know, when you don't have a conscience and you've got the narcissistic, Sociopath. sociopathic, you know, behavior going on. There's no. Yeah, there's no feeling. There's no there's, insight. There's no There's connection nothing. to people or reality. And people like that are very dangerous, and they just need to be dealt with accordingly. Yeah, well, you know, hopefully that'll happen. But, you know, I mean, there's, you know, when you've got that kind of cash, you've also got access to a lot of legal counsel that can, you know, uh, can maneuver you through a lot of dangerous waters, as we've seen in other situations yeah. that have taken place. Yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's wild. Um, And hopefully they'll be putting more regulations on sober livings because those change and there's so many things that go on with sober livings. Especially during the recession, I saw a lot of people trying to save their homes. They would just turn it into a sober living, but they didn't have any recovery experience. They didn't know what they were doing. Right. It was just a mess. What kind of um, advice could you give a young woman? Or a, uh, or a man that has been in that situation where they've gone into these recovery homes and they've been molested? Well, I always tell my clients, to call a central office. Do not go to a sober living that you have not heard about from a person AA that you trust mm-hmm. or being referred. Don't go blind. Ask the manager how much time you have. If he doesn't answer that question immediately, red flag. Ask him how he deals with relapse. Right. Ask him all kinds of questions and I give them a script almost to ask an interview right that's smart that's that's good yeah. I think a lot of that <clears throat> pardon me depending of course on, on who it is but that uh, that's that needs to be uh, taken care of by the family because the the addict or the alcoholic in their in their cups are uh, are incapable of being able to make a decision like that right. Mm-hmm. And so, unless you're completely, you know, alone, uh, it, it's got to fall. And to unfortunately, s- to a lot of my clients have been abandoned by their families, yeah. and right. they're on sure. their own. Alone. So, right. I try to give them as much information as I can. I try to even contact people in AA that I know to get referrals because right. the sober livings change quite often. Like you know, the good ones like Chandler, they're solid, but right. for the most part. They change. If a manager changes and someone goes out, they sometimes stay in the house. It's all bad. So you just have to keep up with the community and stay close to uh, the information. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think that? That's not what I want to say. What I'm thinking here is: Do you think there is a, a level of denial among the uh, recovery community? of these people that have these houses and have these treatment centers, that this is really happening no. on the scale that it's happening? You think they're completely aware? Of I, I don't know how aware they are, but they're, but certainly I, I do not believe that there's denial going on. Mm-hmm. I think, I think uh, we're some of the first people to point the fingers going, wait a minute, this doesn't look right. What the hell's going on here? And I want to know why this feels the way it feels. Right. You know, when we see that stuff going on or when we feel that stuff going on. And by God, if you have a little bit of time, your intuition usually is correct regarding that kind of an affair. I've seen some denial with 13-stepping, though, with men just oh. looking the other way or at a boy, and that was pretty horrifying. Yeah. But I have seen that, unfortunately. 
I would think if you've got a treatment center that you've got a board, there's got to be a board, there's got to be a board of directors, you know, and there would, I would think that one of these people would be asking specific questions of random clients, pulling them in. So how you like the place? How are you being treated? Have you, as this happened, have you been approached this way? Have you been molested? Have you been, have you seen any off color remarks or uh, actions by any of our staff? Hmm. You know, you would think that, you know, especially with this cat, but then he's on the board of directors. Right. Right. He's the guy. You know, I mean, God, it just, uh, you know. It's, it's about business practices, too. And if he's opening and closing, like he, I, I heard the last one he had did go bankrupt, but then he just opened another one. Mm. So he just moves through different groups of people. Right. And that's how he runs from the consequences. And, you know, people have their jobs at stake, and they're afraid to say anything. I think one person is speaking up, but he gets people in the corners where they don't want to lose their job well, or yeah, true, they're true. in treatment and they don't have anywhere else to go. And so then they feel cornered. Yeah, that's a hell of a way to be when you've got nothing and you have, your family's uh, abandoned you because of your behaviors and you're trying to take responsibility for your behaviors, your disease, and trying to turn your life around. And you walk in and you put your trust in an individual and then you get manipulated like that. Uh, that just, uh, you know, that uh, I, I put that right up there with, with pedophilia, Pretty personally, much. personally, you know, because you're you're taking a defenseless, damaged human being that's grasping out for help from the friggin' darkness, you know, and you're cutting their hands off and taking full advantage of them. I mean, it's just it's, it's utter madness. It's pretty oh. despicable. It's like when people have 30 days that they've held on to and fought for, and then they walk into a dirty, sober living. Mm -hmm. And now they're confronted with what they've been craving all day. Right. And they just want a place to stay that's sober, everyone's using, and they don't have anywhere else to go. That's, that's a difficult situation. The one thing that I'd like to stress to people that are new and that are looking at going into treatment centers and recovery houses, sober living houses, there are safe ones. It would be, as Kaylee has mentioned, recommended that you call central office, ask around the rooms, ask the older people in the program that have been around for decades where the safe place is to go. And you'll get directed. Just be careful. And if you don't like what you see, walk. And ask a lot of questions. Ask, ask a lot of questions. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I'm glad you guys, you know, came on, and uh, we, it, it was very informative. Um, this is really all the time we have for this week. I hope that you've been able to take away something from our discussions. I'd like to thank my guests, Kaylee and Jerry. I hope that you can join us next week, and remember that you can download any of our previous shows at www.latalkradio.com. That's www.latalkradio.com. Our mission is to provide a safe platform for those who are suffering from various forms of addiction. We're not professionals in the recovery business. We're just people willing to listen and offer suggestions to help those in crises. And now, words of wisdom from our sober pilot in the afterlife, John Flynn. Disappointment. Disappointment is the caboose on the Tootsie train of expectation. Anything you want from anybody, you give them what you want from them. It's the only way you're going to get it. Life is about giving, not getting. Day at a time. Thank you, John. And thank you for listening. Good night and good luck. You're listening to Life Repair Recovery Talk Radio with Rick Thompson only on L.A. Talk Radio.